Nou kijk, ik denk ons allemaal kan doen met Bikkie advies van hoe veiliger online te verkeer. En gelukkig het ons vandaag die senior kibersecuriteitsstratege Tracy Pretorius bij ons om precies dat woord te gezels. Good morning Tracy. Good morning, thank Good. you for having me. Good morning. Tracy, let's just start with a bit of your background. What did you study? How long have you worked within the cyber security industry? So I was born and raised in South Africa. In fact, I went to school just down the road at St. Mary's DSG. I actually studied industrial psychology, um, oh, which wow. turns out is very useful in the cybersecurity field. At the time, I didn't know it because cybersecurity wasn't a thing back then. When I studied, I'm aging myself with that comment. <laughs> um, I actually moved in 99 to London, and I was in London for six years, and then I moved to the States in 2005. I worked for Microsoft for 18 years and for Google for a year, and so worked, had the privilege to work for $2 trillion companies in this incredibly exciting space. And I recently, at the end of last year, joined a cybersecurity startup, which is wow. headquartered in London and also has offices in DC. That's very exciting. Um, Tracy, I'm going to start with practical questions that, well, I know nothing about technology and I'm sure I make most of these mistakes that we're going to speak about today. So let's start with something um, really quite simple. So for example, when I Google something, you know, me Googling whatever it is, what happens to that data, whatever I Googled, what happens to the data, can it be used, does it get shared? It's an interesting question. So I think if we think about you as a consumer of technology, um, it's all about managing your own digital footprint. I think governments and you know, companies are doing a good job of trying to get ahead of cybersecurity, but individuals are totally lost. Yeah. Um, so let's just go back to that example of what is your digital footprint? Um, a digital footprint is created in two ways. It's created actively and then passively. And the example that you just gave is a passive example because you're now doing a search and your search is actually then being recorded. And so they are actually, um, through that passive gathering of data, they're actually creating a passive digital footprint for yourself. And so that is what happens a lot of the time. I mean, a passive digital footprint is all about data collection that sometimes you're aware of, sometimes you're not aware of, and it's about being aware of what is being collected. It no, might not necessarily tell you for what. It may be for advertising purposes. It may not, people just don't read the T's and C's when they sign up. I think a lot of folks, when they're searching online, just accept all cookies. Yeah. Oh, I'm one of those. <laughs> uh, yes, I do. I like cookies. So I'm like, yes, cookies. <laughs> Listen, we'll get back to the T's and C's now. But I just want to ask you this. When this whole incognito tab uh, came out, everybody was so excited because now I can search what I want to search without it being part of my digital footprint. Is it really incognito? Nobody can see what you're doing. It's saved nowhere. Or does it form part of your digital footprint? It's a great question, Jenny So... You know, as I mentioned, there are two ways in which you're creating your digital footprint, both passively, where things are maybe happening that you're not aware of, or, and that you haven't actively signed up for, or actively, where you are actually agreeing to terms and conditions, or you're aware of what you're searching, or you're aware of what you're sharing online. I mean, the biggest thing is, in that example, is you are being told, if you read the T's and C's, you are being told how things are being shared. So it's really important to take control of what you're doing when you're actively creating your digital footprint. Mm. Wow, that's interesting. Um, I'm a little so worried now. Um, can I ask you, <laughs> Tracy, personally, how often do you just visit sites? Are you personally quite um, secure about which site you go on, uh, what laptops you use, what brands you use, passwords? Absolutely. Um, you know, it, even little things. It's all about, if you think about how you actively create that digital footprint, going back to that. I'm very thoughtful about what I share online because the reality is once it's shared online, it never goes away. That is fact. So I'm very thoughtful about what I share online. Um, I'm also conscious of what others are saying about me online. So yeah. I track um, how is my digital footprint and brand being utilized online. Um, and I'm also very thoughtful about which social media assets I leverage. I use LinkedIn for work and I use Twitter for work, but I rarely use any other social media um, assets at all. Mm. Let's go back to the T's and C's you spoke of earlier. Yes. I'm one of the culprits. I don't read it. I feel like it's too much admin. Yes. But that little feeling that I have of avoiding the admin can actually put my life in danger. Why is it so important to read the T's and C's? It's really important because it's about establishing terms and conditions that you are signing up to. Um, it, I think it's ironic. I think the way in which um, especially social media has actually come into our lives and is, is so much part of our daily lives, we become very trusting. Mm. And it is actually about establishing trust and establishing what you're prepared to share and what you're not prepared to share. You wouldn't buy a house without reading the contract. Yeah. So why would you be prepared to share everything about yourself online without knowing what you're sharing and where it's going? 
Mm. Mm. And I think, you know, this is also a generational thing. I think we, are, we can be very trusting. The internet was originally created for message sharing. Um, and right now, we've got to do a lot of work to make sure that that message sharing, if I'm sharing stuff with Jennifer or yourself, Jen and Lee, I've got to make sure that we're doing it in a trusted fashion. And very often we just are overly trusting. You know, someone will send us a message and we'll say, oh, I trust that this person is who they say they are and I'll accept it. Yeah. We see this a lot on LinkedIn. Mm. People will think, oh, someone wants to connect with me. Let me accept that request without knowing if that person is actually someone you know. Mm, mm. I think, like, if you, you mentioned the social media thing, and I think especially when you look at younger generations that are on social media the whole time, and often we have people um, that come and they speak about the dangers of social media. Yesterday, something like Snapchat, I've never been on Snapchat at all, um, but someone in the office said, you know, Snapchat, you share your location almost the whole time because you can see who else close to you is using Snapchat. Mm. Absolutely. And this is the challenge. The, the, the technology is there to enable amazing things to happen. The challenge is, though, there are always going to be malicious, um, you know, individuals or groups that are nefarious, that want to do things, and you have to just be cautious. Mm -hmm. And I think that people are just blindly sharing stuff without thinking about the implications. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they'll share their location without thinking, now I've actually told a whole lot of people where I am mm -hmm. and yeah. made myself a potential target by doing so. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's interesting because hackers, let me give you an example of when I've traveled recently and I changed companies. Um, I had some phishing attacks happening um, on my email, and I also had some attacks just via text message where um, they'd obviously realized I'd left Google to join a startup. And so I had an email, a text message, sorry, and an email that said, Tracy, please can you contact me? And they used one of our C-suite folks from the cybersecurity startups with their names. Now, I've just joined a new company. They saw that announcement on LinkedIn. Wow. I could have responded to that because I don't know the whole C-suite yet, so why would I not respond? My name was spelled correctly. The name of the person was spelled correctly as well. So they're getting more and more sophisticated. And so you really have to be alert. It's about being alert. Um, and I think you brought up Jennifer earlier, changing your passwords, making sure your privacy settings actually are set up correctly. So on your searches generally, making mm -hmm. sure that when you are searching with search engines or you are utilizing anything, that your privacy settings on all of those are set to the comfort level that you are um, happy with mm -hmm. sharing. Mm -hmm. How often would you change your password? Well, ideally we would move to a passwordless society. Um, passwords, and it's happening more and more. I think a lot of companies are advocating for that. But regularly, I think people are very guilty of having the same password for all of their assets. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> what, I'm going to be quiet now. <laughs> listen, yeah, they've been warning me, and I've been ignoring, you know that warning pops up mm -hmm. that you need to change it. It's been compromised. I'm like, compromised for who? It's my somebody's birth date, you know? So we need to change it constantly. But I'm interested in what you just said. We're trying to move towards a passwordless society. What, what would that mean? Well, and a lot, I see, I, I'm actually quite impressed with the banks here in South Africa, having not lived here for a while, coming back. You'll see that the banks are using a lot more biometrics. Yes. Um, and they're using a lot more methodology around, like, multi-factor authentication when you're doing your, your, your um, interactions with the banks. And that is actually a move in that direction, okay. where you're not relying on someone just using passwords. You're using multiple ways to authenticate a user which builds trust in the system, which just provides layers in, well, it's defense in depth strategy where you're providing layers of security um, wow. to protect. Yeah. And it's quite impressive to see how the banks are doing that here in South Africa. That is incredible. Tracy, we have so many more questions, um, things that we need to find out and learn from, but that will happen after the break. We gaan voort met ons gesprek oor kybersekuriteit saam met natuurlijk die senior kybersekuriteitsstratege Tracy Pretorius. And Tracy, I want to know, if it comes to cybersecurity, who's targeted more often? Is it more individuals or companies, organizations, governments? Um, it's a mix of everything. To be honest with you, often it's individuals within companies or governments, or it could just be an, an, an individual on their own social media asset. Um, companies and governments are doing a lot of work around the world right now to educate and through awareness campaigns their employees to be more responsible with the assets. I mean, if you think about it, you join a company um, and you're given an email address, yeah. and essentially that's the keys to the kingdom, and it comes with a certain you know, expectation that you know how to manage that correctly. Mm -hmm. And wow. I think historically that hasn't been the case. People have seen that as a, as a right as opposed to a privilege. It's a privilege to have an email address to a company, but then it does make the company vulnerable if you haven't provided awareness campaigns around security issues so that your employees at least understand what to be on the lookout for. What else are companies doing? Are there any laws being passed to make us more attentive to protect companies? 
Yeah, absolutely. In the States, actually, recently, President Biden, towards the end of last year, released the Cybersecurity Preparedness Act, where there was a call on government and organizations um, to really ensure that their cybersecurity preparedness is actually raised, raising their level, because the threat landscape is increasing and becoming more and more alarming. And so it would be great to see other countries follow suit um, and make sure that companies and, and governments are actually raising the bar when it comes to cybersecurity preparedness. You'll see a lot of organizations, and I'm sure that's true here in South Africa too, will do cybersecurity exercises um, around what to do if you have a cybersecurity incident or a breach. Um, so a lot of that does happen. I think boards are thinking about cybersecurity as a key risk factor for them, especially those that are also listed and shareholders want to know mm. what are you doing to, to protect our, um, our assets. So there's a lot of work around in, in educating your employee base and then also making sure that you're prepared for if an incident does actually happen. And then, of course, Tracy, identity um, theft is a very big uh, scare at the yes. moment. How do we protect our identity? I mean, who's ever had to think about that? You're just thinking of your physical safety. Mm. Absolutely. And here, in, in particularly in South Africa, where your ID number is, seems to be something that you need to do everything. Yes. Um, you know, I, I recently heard that you need your ID number to even write matric. I don't think it's called matric anymore. I'm aging myself again. I think it's, <laughs> it's grade still, 12. It's still crawling. Okay, okay. Um, but you need your ID number to do that. So, you know, when you're starting to give out numbers like that, um, you, you just need a nefarious actor to get a whole lot of those numbers to spoof identities. Um, and that's what it's all about. In the US, you've got social security numbers. Um, you know, in the UK, you've got a national security number. So, so this is where you've got to do a lot of work to ensure that the data that identifies who you are is always protected and is not found um, to be in the wrong hands because a lot can happen. Money can be taken, you, your identity can be spoofed, people can take out a mortgage in your name. If you're in the US, it's happened before. Um, so there's a lot of stuff and I just don't think people keep track of that as much as mm. they should. Mm. Tracy, when you go around to these organizations and you educate them about cybersecurity, what is the one thing that you normally tell them that they're most surprised by? Well, I think there's two things actually. The first is, it's not a question of if they're going to have a cybersecurity attack. It's a question of when. So they're not really surprised by that, but they don't want to hear that. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's, so I, I add that in. I think that the main thing that I'd like to leave when we do these exercises, um, you know, with organizations or government entities, even individuals and at, school is, at schools, is think about don't let your first crisis be a real one. Mm -hmm. You need to be proactive. Don't yeah. be, you know, defend for it. Make sure that you know what to do. If you're working at a company, identify phishing emails, there's a way to report it. Make sure you report it. If you notice something on your bank statements, check your bank statements. If you notice something, immediately take action. Don't leave it. I think people are complacent, mm. too trusting, and don't take enough action and are not prepared. Have you thought about, especially at companies I ask, have you thought about the day after the disaster? Mm. And very often there isn't that work done. People yes. feel... Well, we have a file that we've created, so we, ha we feel very comfortable that we know what to do, but they haven't rehearsed it. Yes. Um, and the reality is, in a crisis, no one's got time to go through the file to see what they're supposed to be doing. This is a dynamic environment. It's a very fluid environment. You have to res respond quickly and be agile and flexible when these things happen. And I think that's, that's really key for organizations. But it goes back to do not let your first crisis be a real one. Mm. Tracy, something like WhatsApp we, we use every day. How safe is WhatsApp? All of these platforms have their pros and cons, quite frankly. Um, I've seen that it's definitely a prolific app that's used here in the South African market, probably because there's no cost associated to using yes. it. Mm -hmm. um, I am alarmed with what people are prepared to share, like copies of passports, identity documents. Um, certain industries rely, in fact, on doing business 100%, it seems, over the tool. Yes. Um, it's not as safe as email because it doesn't have the security features. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly don't like sharing any of my um, personal details. It goes back to my ID over a, a social media app, um, app like that at all. I'm happy to do it via email where I know that there are um, more security layers um, that can protect if something does go wrong. Sure. So I won't be sharing my passport or my ID with anyone um, via WhatsApp. That is very, very terrifying because a lot of South African companies do business that way. You send your ID, yes. you sign the contract, your signatures on there, everything is on there. I never thought about it. I, I've always said I think one of the problems with our generation is we um, are the information generation, but we were never trained on how to manage information. That's a, that's a great point, Jenny. And I think, you know, I look back at myself, I didn't have email at school. Um, and I certainly, I had to 
I had to do a license to learn how to drive a car. In fact, everywhere around the world, you cannot drive a car unless you've done a license. It's a form of test. Yes. What I find ironic is none of us have really been taught unless you went that route by choice on how to utilize all these assets effectively. So I never had an email address at school. So my first email address was at work and I learned as I went along. Um, and I think, you know, the, 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 the newer generations and the younger generations are learning much faster. They're Absolutely. more trusting, though. Absolutely. And, and that's the thing. So, you know, at least they know how to leverage the tools more effectively, but they're also more trusting, I think. Um, I think our generation's not sure about the tools and then also is not sure what to trust and then blindly trusts sometimes just to get the job done. Yeah. And, and, and this is the thing, just uh, quickly from my side, lastly, is that people don't understand, besides the security of it, your digital footprint also influences your career. Absolutely. That's a great point. In fact, having worked at, you know, now in the tech sector for 25 years, um, we would hire folks by doing a digital footprint search to understand it's no longer about your, you know, two page resume that you send in. Um, it's all about, you know, the digital footprint that you yourself have created. And very often we will do that search prior to um, interviewing anybody or actually during the interview, we'll ask them mm. questions about some things we will have seen. So, and, and I think I started off our segment today talking about that what you share online is there forever. I think a lot of folks think that if I've deleted it, it's gone. Well, that's if somebody else didn't find it first and save it somewhere. So the reality is, you know, be thoughtful. I, I think a big tip is be thoughtful about what you share online. Um, don't share anything that you don't, I always say to folks, don't um, say something you don't want to be quoted on. Don't yes. share something you don't want to see if wow. you're not happy with it. Tracy, thank you so much for coming in today and speaking to us and just educating us also about what to look out for. And I think that is the lasting kind of thought you leave with us. Don't share just anything online. Think about it. But thank you very much for your time today. Well, thank you for having me and stay safe. <laughs> thank you.